it's always been said from time immemorial that genius and madness has something kin. And I think it really is that her sort of genius was connected with her sort of madness. And that you could see it uh, in the way that her mind worked uh, when she was perfectly sane. To the wakeful, to the hopeful, walking the beach, stirring the pool, came imaginations of the strangest kind, of flesh turned to atoms which drove before the wind, of stars flashing in their hearts, of cliff, sea, cloud and sky brought purposely together to assemble outwardly the scattered parts of the vision within. Virginia Woolf was born in London in 1882 the daughter of Leslie Stephen, who was the editor of the Dictionary of National Biography, and of his second wife, Julia. She had two brothers, Toby and Adrian. Her sister, Vanessa, became a painter, and later married the writer and critic, Clive Bell. From her earliest years, Virginia was a writer. For three years, Virginia and Toby Stephen kept the family newspaper, the Hyde Park Gate News, this recorded their doings both at Hyde Park Gate and at Tarrant House in Cornwall, where they went for the summers. The entry for Monday, September the 12th, 1892, is, I think, particularly interesting. On Saturday morning, Master Hilary Flint and Master Basil Smith came up to Tarrant House and asked Master Toby and Miss Virginia Stephen to accompany them to the lighthouse as Freeman the boatman said that there was a perfect tide and wind for going there. Master Adrian Stephen was much disappointed at not being allowed to go. On arriving at the lighthouse, Miss Virginia Stephen saw a small and dilapidated bird standing on one leg on the lighthouse. Mrs. Hunt called the man and asked him how it had got there. He said it had been blown there, and they then saw that its eyes had been picked out. On the way home, Master Basil Smith spewed like fury to the lighthouse. Her mother, Julia Stephen, died two years after Virginia recorded these events. Thirty-five years later, she used the experience as the basis of her novel, To the Lighthouse. It's fine tomorrow, said Mrs. Ramsay, but you'll have to be up with the lark. To her son, these words conveyed an extraordinary joy, as if it was settled the expedition were bound to take place, and the wonder to which he had looked forward for years and years, it seemed, was after a night's darkness and a day's sail within touch. Since he belonged, even at the age of six, to that great clan which cannot keep this feeling separate from that, but must let future prospects, with their joys and sorrows, cloud what is actually at hand, since for such people, even in earliest childhood, any turn in the wheel of sensation has the power to crystallize and transfix the moment upon which its gloom or radiance rests. James Ramsay, sitting on the floor, cutting out pictures from the illustrated catalogue of the Army and Navy stores, endowed the picture of a refrigerator with heavenly bliss. It was fringed with joy. But, said his father, stopping in front of the drawing room window, it won't be fine.
They were very close to the lighthouse now. There it loomed up, stark and straight, glaring white and black, and one could see the waves breaking in white splinters like smashed glass upon the rocks. One could see lines and creases in the rocks. One could see the windows clearly, a dab of white on one of them and a little tuft of green on the rock. So it was like that, James thought. The lighthouse one had seen across the bay all these years. It was a stark tower on a bare rock. It satisfied him. It confirmed some obscure feeling of his about his own character. To the Lighthouse was published in 1927, when Virginia Woolf was 45. She'd been married to Leonard Woolf, the publisher and political writer, for 15 years, and had already produced four novels and a large amount of journalism. They lived partly in London and partly in a Sussex cottage, Monk's House, Rodmell. They had many friends, and Virginia's sister lived nearby. Vanessa's son, Quentin Bell, is at present engaged in writing his aunt's biography. His sister, Angelica, is married to the novelist, David Garnett. Dame Janet Vaughan, the scientist, is a cousin. Duncan Grant, the painter, remembers Virginia from her early youth. George Rylands, the scholar and anthologist, worked with her in London, while Louis Mayer kept house for her in Sussex. Benedict and Nigel Nicholson are the sons of the late Harold Nicholson and the novelist Vita Sackville-West, who was perhaps Virginia's greatest friend. Raymond Mortimer, the critic, Elizabeth Bowen, the novelist, William Plumer, the poet, and David Cecil, the biographer, each got to know her when they were beginning their careers as writers. They all agreed on one thing. Virginia Woolf was my idea of what one means exactly by a genius. That is to say, for me, a genius means somebody who sees the world and is able to make other people see it in quite a different light to anyone else, as I've done before. And so that when you read them, I'm talking of authors now, uh, they are what I've heard somebody else describe as a before and an after writer. Life is not the same after as it has been before. Somebody who jumps a gap which other people would need a very, very solid bridge to walk across. Uh, I can't find it any better than that, and I think this is what Virginia did. A genius in a sense which I cannot really think of anybody else of my own time, a genius in literature. I do think she was a genius. I know she was a genius. She's the only genius as far as I know, with perhaps one exception, that I have ever s sat in a room with, been familiar with, stayed in the house with, been f f for a walk with. Genius bursting out all over. It's a vision. If it doesn't seize on you and you don't see it, well, you can't sympathize at all, as there are many people who can't. They just think that it's a blown up lot of uh, sort of talking about herself or something. But if you're got by it, it simply sends you, I think. <laughs> there is no unanimity of opinion about Virginia Woolf's character or appearance. She looks rather like uh, Madonna. On the other hand, there was something deeply mocking in her and amused. And so if you can imagine a mocking Madonna. When one says people look like horses or something, it doesn't sound very flattering. But she was somewhere in a cross between a, a, a greyhound and a horse like an abbess in the 17th century, perhaps. The wife of a very distinguished soldier. Something between a Valkyrie and a Botticelli dancer. Everyone who met her allows her great distinction of features and an exceptional magnetism of personality. She was highly cultivated. She was an astonishingly prolific and painstaking writer. She was a mystic. She was, perhaps, a great literary critic. She was a feminist. She was arrogant and malicious. She was obsessively inquisitive. She was morbidly shy. And yet she was the best and kindest of companions. Such contradictions are often found in the characters of people who are gifted with imagination and the energy to transform their experience into art. As she lurched, for she rolled like a ship at sea, and leered, for her eyes fell on nothing directly, 
but with a sidelong glance that deprecated the scorn and anger of the world. She was witless. She knew it. As she clutched the banisters and hauled herself upstairs and rolled from room to room, she sang. Among the shrouded jugs and sheeted chairs, even the prying of the wind and the soft noise of the clammy sea airs rubbing, snuffling, iterating and reiterating their questions. Will you fade? Will you perish? Scarcely disturbed the peace, the indifference, the air of pure integrity, as if the question they asked scarcely needed they should answer, we remain. Nothing, it seemed, could break that image, corrupt that innocence, or disturb the swaying mantle of silence, which week after week in the empty room wove into itself the falling cries of birds, ships hooting, the drone and hum of the fields, a dog's bark, a man's shout, and folded them round the house in silence. Throughout her life, Virginia Woolf kept up a quite astonishing output. She wrote reviews and essays and biographies, she kept an enormous journal, and she wrote nine full-length novels. She never sat to write. She always stood at her desk, as it were, which was based on the fact, I was always told, that Vanessa used to, st to stand painting in their old home, and she couldn't bear to sit at the same time, so she had this large, high stool made for her own writing, which she continued to do, uh, at least all the time she was in Fitzroy Square. So later on she gave that up, she used to work sitting, always <coughs> with great um, pleasure in a good pen. She was continually acquiring new nibs, new pens. Uh, it obviously meant a great deal to her, the actual feel of a pen cutting over the paper nicely. It gave her a kind of physical sensation, I imagine. She was one of those writers who, when they're writing, move into some other world altogether. It absolutely came hot like lava from her. And then, of course, she went back over it and went back over it again and back over it again. And at last, when it had gone to, the, gone to the printers, then she had this terrible reaction because she could not yet again take it and go through it. But I think she was in a state of trance. And that, therefore, it wasn't a question of being ill or not ill, except that you can say that mystics and people who write in that kind of way, not in the way that, say, Somerset Maugham wrote or Trollope wrote or something, in which it's a job, a professional thing, and you know exactly how to do your profession, that she was one of those people, like the poets and the painters and the musicians, who is inspired. And you can say that when people are inspired, they're ill, because they aren't like us anyway. Leonard Wolfe died in August 1969. In a film made by Stephen Peat in 1967, he talked about his wife and read this extract from her journal. This is the, uh, an interesting piece because it's the, what she wrote when, about the uh, finishing the waves. Here in the few minutes that remain, I must record heavenly praise the end of the waves. I wrote the words, O oh Death, 15 minutes ago, having reeled across the last 10 pages with some moments of such intensity and intoxication that I seemed only to stumble after my own voice, after some sort of speaker, as when I was mad. From the age of 13, when her mother died, to the time of her own death in 1941, she was afflicted with periodic fits of insanity. These varied in ferocity from nervous headaches to attacks of suicidal mania and depression. So terrible was life that I held up shade after shade. Look at life through this. Look at life through that. Let there be rose leaves. Let there be vine leaves. I covered the whole street, Oxford Street, Piccadilly Circus, with the blaze and ripple of my mind with vine leaves and rose leaves. I flung words in fans, like those the sower throws over the ploughed fields when the earth is bare. I desired always to stretch the night and fill it fuller and fuller with dreams. There's a portrait of her by Vanessa Bell in which the face is left blank. The outline, the shape of the face is quite apparent 
from the painting. But she hasn't put in the features. And in some extraordinary way, it is Virginia. It's as it were Virginia's room. I once uh, uh, intended to paint a large, large picture in Fitzroy Square, of Virginia sitting, reading in, in the corner of a large room. But that, I only have a drawing of. Nothing came of it. Things happened that prevented it. Another occasion, I was able to, uh, to do something of her in a, when she went for a visit to the nurse in Gordon Square, and I was painting there in any case, so she wasn't alarmed at seeing my painting things about the room. And she had a long conversation with Vanessa, and while and quite um, with, uh, uh, unconsciously, she, uh, I, I did a portrait of her. That was the only thing, time I ever was able to pull anything through. But she was very, very averse to being looked at in any way. When Stephen Tomlin did the bust of her. She really got into such a state that uh, uh, Leonard had to ask him to stop. He was afraid that it really might make her ill. She got into such a stew. She hated being looked at, scrutinized in any way, I think. Yet she so loved scrutinizing other people. Uh, I know. <laughs> That's true. But that would hardly make her <laughs> alter her own views. Well, she felt she never, never, never could know enough about life in any aspect. She was like the um, child that puts its finger into the anemone, you know, to see if it'll close up. She could be rather, rather cruel, you know, and uh, uh, she, she could say very nasty things about it. I mean... Her what diaries is, are rather vicious. In, they they in, in can parts, be, yes. they can be. And uh, what's so extraordinary is that really she was one of the most remarkable people of, uh, of her day. You, you would have thought that uh, she wouldn't have felt jealous of other people, but she did. And she was malicious about people she felt jealous of. Sometimes our judgments were queered, I think. I sort of, I could only say, if we, even if it's used in the Bible, the Lord thy God is a jealous God, thou shalt have another God but me. I mean, there was that, the touch of, um, of that about her. I never heard her say a mean thing, but she, she did, as I say, some fa say some fairly fiendish things. She said to me, one unfortunate lady who called, she thinks she looks like Shelley, but actually she looks like a sugar mouse. I think her letters to Lytton Stretcher do reveal a, a, a horrid streak of malice. There was a kind of feeling between them, a certain rivalry. They had great admiration for each other, but they had sharp wits, you know, and they had a t malice. There was a good streak of malice in each of them. Malice at its best, you know sort of a congreve world of malice, which adds to the gaiety of life. She would ask uh, absolutely everybody, and if she'd never met them before, she would start off by asking them uh, some question or other about their lives. I mean, our stock family joke was that she always asked everybody, what did you have for breakfast? She wanted to know about what was happening in one's life, and the most commonplace things seemed to surprise her. What you mean, say, you rarely wear uh, sand shoes when you go out for a walk on the downs? Impossible. You walked down the street. Why did you walk down the street? Who were you with? What did you see? Did you see a cat? Did you see a dog? She said to me, now, tell me what happened today. And I said, well, nothing. I've, I've just come home from school, and here I am. And she said, no, 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 that's no good. Start at the beginning. What woke you up? And I thought, and I said, well, it was the sun coming through the window at school. And then she leant forward and she said, what sort of sun? Was it a gentle sun or an angry sun? And so from that we went on. And it was really a sort of game, but it was also a lesson in observation. I it, don't think that you remembered this story I, right. I promise you I I think I'm going to it up with another story. No, it's absolutely <laughs> vivid to me. Because uh, it was then for the first time that I began to understand what Virginia's writing was all about. It's really observation of human character. She wasn't very good at that. She well, she was very too. good at, at the way in which character is expressed by gesture, dress, possessions, behavior, all that sort of thing. So long as she was able to create complete fantasy. And if one had lived down the bottom of the cave, she would immediately say, your wonderful cave lined with pink crystal um, st stalactites or something of that sort. There you are with princesses in tiaras and ambassadors in cocked hats crowding up your stairs to meet 
Picasso and Matisse and Gide and so it was all totally unreal. I didn't know any ambassadors. And um, Matisse and Picasso never came to see me. I went to see them. And then gradually her picture became quite wild, the, the glory and splendor and interest of your life, as she pretended. It was, she was really laughing at one the whole time, but I have seen innocent victims swallow the whole thing and go away with their heads in the air, thinking what wonderful lives they had. It wasn't a fantasy that she was building up, but collecting the raw, raw material, and one was raw material, and the more raw one was of sweat and meat, the better she liked it. I think it was in 1928 that Virginia came down to read a paper to Newnham, and of course I asked her, her and Leonard to come and have lunch with me, for well, it was to this room that Leonard and Virginia came, and I don't doubt I had two or three other people, perhaps Forster, to lunch to meet them, and uh, that luncheon is described in a room of one's own. It goes as follows. I shall take the liberty to defy the convention and tell you that lunch on this occasion began with soles sunk in a deep dish, over which the college cook had spread a counterpane of the whitest cream, save that it was branded here and there with brown spots, like the spots on the flanks of a doe. After that came the partridges, but if this suggests a couple of bald brown birds on a plate, you are mistaken. Partridges, many and various, came with all their retinue of sauces and salads, the sharp and the sweet, each in its order. Their potatoes, thin as coins, but not so hard. Their sprouts, foliated as rosebuds, but more succulent. And no sooner had the roast and its retinue been done with than the silent serving man, the beadle perhaps himself, in a milder manifestation, set before us wreathed in napkins a confection which rose all sugar from the waves. To call it pudding, and so related to rice and tapioca would be an insult. Meanwhile, the wine glasses flush yellow and flush crimson had been emptied, been filled, and thus by degrees was lit halfway down the spine, which is the seat of the soul. Not that hard little electric light which we call brilliance, as it pops in and out upon our lips, but the more profound, subtle and subterranean glow, which is the rich yellow flame of rational intercourse. No need to hurry, no need to sparkle, no need to be anybody but oneself. We are all going to heaven, and Van Dyke is of the company. Well, I'm glad it seemed like that to Virginia, and perhaps, no, not so much, I suspect, Leonard. Of course it seemed like that to me. This was glamour and romance. But uh, partridges, various. I don't think there could be more than one kind of partridge. And I don't very much like the idea, except that it is very like college cooking, of a counterpane of sauce with some little brown flecks on it. Never mind, and I hope there were two wines. I think it's unlikely. I think there probably was only one. Anyway, as when she describes Bond Street in Mrs. Dalloway, or when she describes a herbaceous ball down which all the flowers of all the seasons are blooming at the same time, as always with Virginia, it is the idealized, the romantic fantasy of what should have been and what it was to her and what it certainly was to me. During the First War, Leonard and Virginia Woolf founded a publishing firm called the Hogarth Press. Virginia herself set the type, and Leonard worked the foot treadle. In the early days, they published poems of T.S. Eliot, including the first edition of The Wasteland. At this time, they lived in various houses in London, now destroyed, either by bombs, developers, or the University of London. loved London in this extraordinary way and knew it so well. Heaven only knows why one loves it so, how one sees it so, making it up, building it round one, tumbling it, creating it every moment fresh, at the veriest fronts, the most dejected of miseries sitting on doorsteps, drink their downfall, do the same. Can't be dealt with, she felt positive by acts of Parliament for that very reason, they love life. In people's eyes, in the swing, tramp and trudge, in the bellow and the uproar, the carriages, motor cars, omnibuses, vans, sandwichmen shuffling and swinging, brass bands, barrel organs, in the triumph, 
and the jingle and the strange high singing of some airplane overhead was what she loved. Life, London, this moment of June. When Virginia's brother Toby went to Cambridge, he met a number of brilliant young men, including Leonard Wolfe, the biographer Lytton Strachey, the economist Maynard Keynes, and Saxon Sidney Turner. This group was later to be joined by other friends, including Roger Fry and Clive Bell, and it formed the nucleus of a society in which Virginia Woolf was to spend the rest of her life. When it was called Bloomsbury, and I, I think it existed. Was there such a thing as Bloomsbury? Well, if there wasn't, it had to be invented. Uh, uh, I, think, I, I, I think there was such a thing as Bloomsbury. And uh, oddly enough, Bloomsbury people themselves uh, disagree. They were a, a very solid group, and uh, when I first went to any party there, you were very aware of it. They had a manner. I don't think it's at all true to call them affected, which I've heard said. It was like any close group. You get certain mannerisms. And I, uh, uh, of voice and, and um, um, phrasing. And they had a rather breathless way of talking and a very solemn face. That was the thing I noticed. And that was a little uh, alarming, because when they shook hands with you, they didn't smile. They just handed the hand. And if you didn't know them, this uh, grave look, and this limp handshake uh, was not welcoming. They were so much more amusing above all than anyone else, any other group of people that I'd met before, or indeed have met since. I did have the impression uh, that they uh, were rather superior people, but then they were rather superior people, and I don't mind superior people. I rather like them. The only person who remembers Virginia in her early Bloomsbury days is the painter, Duncan Grant. He's lived in a Sussex farmhouse under the South Downs since 1916. Before that, he shared a studio flat with Maynard Keynes next door to the house in Fitzroy Square, owned by Virginia and her brother Adrian. It was here that the first Bloomsbury parties took place. As far as I remember, so after dinner, so nine or ten, I think, that sort of time, as far as I remember, And they trickled in. Well, they trickled in and they trickled out, yes. <laughs> but and, they, they were enjoyably. I think everybody enjoyed themselves. They came again. And I remember clearly being taken as a, as a boy to, uh, to Bloomsbury parties. In, um, in Duncan Grant's studio, particularly, I think, it, I think it was in Fitzroy Square at that time. And uh, I have a very clear memory of long, narrow passages, barren, empty corridors, looking rather like Roman catacombs. Rather austere evenings, sometimes rather silent evenings, but sometimes hilarious, with um, nearly always Saxon, Sidney Turner, enigmatic, silent, um, occasionally remarking cryptically Oh, something about the railway connections between Bayreuth and Cologne, um, making an allusion to uh, Thucydides that one ought to understand. Well, the great regular was Saxon Turner. He was always there, and always the last to leave, very often not till three in the morning. Adrian used to rather complain at that. <laughs> but. Um, and he wasn't a great talker. Blasphemous and obscene is the way the conversation has been described. 
of, of Lisbon Stretch and his friends about the year 1910. They disagreed perhaps violently. And I remember on one occasion they threw butter at each other. And there was a large mark on the wall where it missed fire. But um, that ended up in smiles and, 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 and laughter generally. I don't remember it was particularly serious. But all Bloomsbury people were always there, and there were outsiders who had been invited, who were uh, uh, special, uh, uh, special friends. And terrified. Uh, and terrified out of their lives, <laughs> and you could pick out, even if you didn't know who all Bloomsbury people were, you could always pick out who was Bloomsbury and who wasn't. Because they, they were under tr on trial. They right? were on trial. And they knew they were on trial. And Johnny soon yeah. uh, chucked out if they didn't come up to scraps. It was an easy atmosphere because it was as it were the equivalent of a family atmosphere. There was little to eat or drink. In those days, drink wasn't considered necessary. There was always coffee to start with, and on the sideboard, uh, whiskey and soda for those who liked a later drink before going away. And I'd and buns, perhaps, to eat, but nothing very much. But nobody seemed to expect very much in those days. And there was nothing really except heaps of strawberries and cream and cheap white wine and all that. I didn't mind much in those days about what one ate and drank, as long as there was plenty of everything, of course. But, but on that occasion, there came a very famous popular novelist called Bertha Ruck, who, of course, you'll never even have heard of. Although not as famous as Ethel M. Dale, she belonged to the Ethel M. Dale world of bestsellers, Bertha Ruck, and she was awfully jolly, and I think she was married to a bestseller writer called Oliver Onions. Anyway, be that as it may, she came. And up in my bedroom, which was a sort of attic room, where there was a party spread all over the house, she was up there with me and with Virginia. And uh, there was a certain complication about this, because in one of Virginia's books, possibly it's in To the Lighthouse, she describes walking through a cemetery and looking at the names on the graves. And one of the names is Berta Ruck. Well, it's just... Virginia hadn't the faintest idea who Berta Ruck was, who sold, I suppose, 500 times more copies a year than Virginia ever sold, you see, but she'd never really heard of her. But the name somewhere had stuck, so when she was writing a count of names in this cemetery, she wrote Bertha Ruck on one of the tombstones. Well, as you can imagine, the publishers got onto this, and Bertha Ruck got onto this, and Oliver Onion Sotis got onto this. How it was settled out, of course, and all that came all right. Anyway, here they were meeting at this party up in my attic, and uh, Bertha Ruck sang a Victorian musical song, I Never Allow a Sailor an Inch Above My Knee. And Virginia sat and rejoiced. Although Virginia enjoyed seeing people, Leonard always had to protect her. He had to be the family dragon. He had to hold people at bay. Uh, an unwelcome role. And um, be the person who said, you must leave the party. You must go to bed now. You must eat more. You must rest. And so on. When he married her in 1912, Leonard Wolfe was aware that Virginia was mentally unstable, but he could not have foreseen how gravely ill she was to become. So he was in the position of a man with an immensely precious object, who is on a boat in a tempest, and fears that every lurch will shatter what he holds, which at the same time is the woman he loves. When I think of an ideal married relationship, really. Uh, I think of their relationship as being one of the best anyway. I mean, considering that no marriage is ever completely perfect. And, uh, I mean, doubtless there were imperfections. They didn't have any children. So in that way, it wasn't a sort of normal married life, but it was a wonderful companionship. And they had a very... Uh, I think the, the thing I most admire about their relationship was their close sympathy in their values and ideas about life, and um, their absolute honesty to each other about everything, even about the tiny things. Monk's House Rodmel is a cottage with a large garden near the Sussex town of Lewis. Here, Virginia and Leonard Wolfe spend an increasing amount of time. Louis Mayer, their housekeeper, describes the pattern of daily life there. I came at eight in the morning. Mr. Wolf, if he wasn't up, I would knock the door and call him. I would lay the breakfast, get it all ready, uh, put Mrs. Wolf on the tray. And when he came and he did the coffee, because they loved their coffee, what they made, not what anybody else made. 
and uh, he would carry the tray to her room and I would come behind with the coffee and she would have always have breakfast in bed and uh, read her letters. But when I used to go in, I always noticed, it struck me that she must have been awake in the night or early hours in the morning writing on her writing pad and I always <laughs> come in and have a bath after that, walk in her dressing gown and sit in the bath and she always had um, a habit you think Both she and Leonard were deeply disturbed by the political situation in She became seriously well, I think when she was Partly through being exceptionally immature, I think, that uh, I hadn't realised the I I impact that the war had on her. I mean, the strain of the, uh, feel is it the feeling the bomb is going to be invaded and all that. I mean, she and Leonard had decided to blow themselves up in their garage if Hitler invaded England, you know, quite literally. And uh, um, that in itself, and I don't, I mean, I hadn't realized that she felt that she was going to go mad again. So that this, although uh, we were living close by at the time, and I saw her a few days before it happened, and I realized that she was under the weather, and uh, she made this uh, sort of tremendous demand for love that she was in the habit of making, rather. I mean, she would, particularly, I think, just because I was an undemonstrative child, she would quite often say, but Angelica, don't you love me? Don't you adore me? Do you? You know you hate me. You know you don't like me at all, this sort of way of going on. But she did it particularly on that day. And, of course, I mean, as I remember it, um, I was particularly cold and undemonstrative on that day. And then the next thing, I heard, you know, a telephone call to say that she had drowned herself. It was near lunchtime when we discovered she was missing. I cooked her a leg of mutton and got mint sauce, which she liked very much. And I rang the bell. We used to have a bell in those days, and I used to ring it, and she would hear it in the garden room and come for lunch, and Mr. Wolf would come down too. When I rang it, Mr. Wolf rushed downstairs and said, I must go up to the sitting room and listen to the news, because the war was very bad then, and he wanted to know what had happened in Germany with the war. When he got there, 
he must have looked on the table and saw two notes laying there. One was for him with Leonard on it, and the other was for Mrs. Bell, Vanessa Bell. And he picked up his and read it and rushed down and said, Oh, Louis, where is Mrs. Wolf, which way has Mrs. Wolf gone? I think she might have committed suicide. And of course, I took fright and I rushed too up the garden, but I couldn't see anything. And uh, he said, no, I suppose she probably went towards the river. And he, he just ran off towards the river. And uh, I thought, what's the best next thing to do? So I ran and told the gardener and the gardener rushed up to the local police station and said, would the policeman come? And they both went to the river and they found her walking stick there. And it was about over a fortnight, I think, before we really discovered some boys found it on the river bank. And as it happened the last d d day I saw her when I was staying there, uh, I remember kneeling back on the floor we were taking away, mending a torn curtain in the house. And she sat back on her heels and put her head back in a patch of sun, early spring sun, and laughed in this consuming, choking, the delightful hooting way. When I say hooting, I can't think of the ooh, sort of like that. And it was, it has remained with me. So that I, I get a curious shock when I see people regarding her entirely as a, a martyred saint of art or a, totally tragic or a person claimed by the darkness. I mean, she went, she ended as far as we know in darkness, but where is she now? Nobody with capacity for joy, I think, can be entirely. And it was joy. There was a great deal of beauty brought in today. Farmhouses, cliffs standing out to sea, marbled fields, mottled fields, red feathered skies, all that. Also, there was disappearance and the death of the individual, the vanishing road, the window lit for a second and then dark. And then there was a sudden dancing light that was hung in the future. What we have made then today, I said, is this. That beauty, death of the individual, and the future. Look, I will make a little figure for your satisfaction. Here he comes. Thus this little figure advancing through beauty, through death, to the economical, powerful, and efficient future satisfy you? We sat and looked at the figure we had made that day. Great sheer slabs of rock, tree tufted, surrounded him. A violent thrill ran through us as if a charge of electricity had entered into us. We cried out together, yes, yes, as if affirming something in a moment of recognition. Off with you, I said to my assembled selves. Your work is done. I dismiss you. Good night.
This program was brought to you by Sensodyne. What a day. I got a pain right in the middle of the scene. I just bit into the ice cream. So I went to the dentist. He didn't drill or anything. He said my teeth react to hot or cold. Called it dental hypersensitivity. So I got Sensodyne. Use daily. Sensodyne toothpaste's advanced formula works effectively to calm the pain of sensitive teeth. Okay, cut. Coffee break. Ah, terrific. Thank you. Sensodyne. Proven to relieve the pain of sensitive teeth. It works for me, but check with your dentist. I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I had my retirement all planned perfectly. But when I told the accountant at work that I wasn't going to be eligible for the pension or any benefits, you know what? He told me that I might be missing out on something I deserve to get. And then he told me to go and see AMP. I said, AMP? He said, yeah. To talk to AMP Financial Services about planning your future, call 1-800-800-882. musician and songwriter Stephen Cummings makes the transition to novelist and we look at the future of Aboriginal writing. That's the book show, 5.30 Sunday or Friday night after the movie. Every day doctors are faced with complications due to breast implants. Tuesday night at 8.30 we uncover the scandal. Ça ne doit pas continuer, il faut faire quelque chose. On n'a pas le droit de massacrer la vie des gens comme ça. On n'a pas le droit. The dangers were dismissed or underestimated. The consequences, devastating. But all the with gel of silicone, I think that now it's well established that silicone has all the same effects at long term. You have to make people do it. Not to be missed, the silicone breast implant scandal, 8.30 Tuesday on The Cutting Edge. It's not going to be the best summer holiday for Otto. He's missed the football team and taken it out on the umpire. His best friend has gone away. There's a strange young man in town and a dead girl in his favorite swimming spot. And back at home, there are rats in the cellar and the caretaker is on the prowl. Norway's entry for the 1994 Oscars is a dark and funny mystery about the last summer Otto will spend as a little boy and events that will change his family forever. Cross my heart and hope to die. Your movie of the week, 9.30, Thursday. Bordeaux. Bayern Munich. Thursday, 8.30. Highlights. First leg of the UEFA.